live weekend. Um, and I'm so excited to be here uh, worshiping with all of you this morning. Um, I trust that everybody had a safe uh, holiday as we honored and showed gratitude uh, for our freedoms uh, and for those who uh, sacrificed their lives so that we would have freedom and particularly uh, as Christians so that you and I would have the freedom to be able to gather together, to assemble together, uh, and to worship God. And so for that we give thanks this morning. For those who don't know me or for, uh, haven't had a chance to meet me yet, uh, my name's Jeremy. And I'm going to be, or am, the new pastor here at Kajani Free Methodist Church. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be able uh, to look, uh, serve you and to, learn, uh, to serve alongside of you uh, as we seek to glorify God, as we seek to do kingdom-minded work, uh, as we seek uh, to serve Christ. And uh, I just wanted to start my time off this morning with you. Just, just to let you know, um, I'm super excited and super thrilled uh, to be able to be here with you, uh, to be able to, to be your pastor, and to be able to love you well, uh, as I believe the first calling of the pastor is, to love uh, the congregation, to love the community well. And that's, that's my heart, uh, to love you well. And, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that this morning. Uh, but I wanted to uh, extend that uh, to you uh, before we dug too deeply into worship this morning. Um, be before we get too uh, far in, uh, just uh, a reminder, um, we are indeed live here. Um, we are on site, uh, but we are also broadcasting through Facebook Live for those folks who are unable uh, to be able to, to be with us for a variety of different reasons. So we also want to extend a welcome to those who are watching at home. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Uh, if you have offering or ties to give, the offering plate is in the back. Please be sure uh, to drop your offering or your tithe there. Um, please keep your eye on the church's Facebook page if you're on Facebook. Uh, in the coming uh, weeks, uh, I'll be putting some stuff up on the Facebook page to let you guys get to know me and maybe my family a little bit better. Uh, because we have the COVID-19 issue, getting to know people is really challenging, uh, particularly as people are wearing masks and we have to, to, to maintain a, a six foot distance apart. Uh, the normal means of social convention of getting to know people becomes that much more difficult. So I'm going to be putting some videos up uh, about myself. Uh, you might see my family there. We're talking about how we might do that. Um, and uh, I'll be putting some things up in regards to some ways that, that we can connect and, and hopefully be able to get, get to know each other uh, better. So please be paying attention to the, to the Facebook page. And, and there will be some, some things there uh, to help, I think, facilitate some some getting to know one another, some fellowship, and some opportunity to, to make some connection there. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to make mention, we do have um, uh, a yard sale coming up on July 10th and 11th. That'll be Friday and Saturday. Uh, please make sure to kind of save the date for that uh, as well. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's spend some time worshiping God this morning. Uh, I want to start off with a call to worship, and I'd like to um, invite you to take a few minutes after I read these verses out of Psalm 33. Uh, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments of just quiet, silent reflection. You will find, as you get to know me, that I'm a huge proponent, really, really big fan of silence and the importance of being quiet and still before God. Uh, most of us are super busy. Our lives are hectic. We don't always take the time that we need to be still. And so one of the things that I like to incorporate, uh, incorporate into worship is just having, from time to time, a few moments to be still, to, to put ourselves before God, and to let the Spirit just speak to us. And I'd like for us to use these verses that I'm about to read just as a catalyst, as a starting point this morning, a place where we can 
give some reflection and time as we listen for God's still small voice speaking into our lives. And so I invite you after I read these verses just to take a couple of minutes just to be still and quiet before God and then I will uh, close that time off uh, with a word of prayer. Our call to worship, our verses this morning are from Psalm 33 verses 8 through 12. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world Stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And I'd like to invite you to take just a couple of minutes to be still and silent before God, thinking about these verses. Holy Spirit into this place this morning. Rest upon us. Bring peace into our hearts. Give us joy. Convict us there's anything in our, our lives, Lord, that is displeasing to you. Remind us of your unfailing love, your immeasurable love for us. Lord, as we gather in this place to worship this morning, to give you honor and glory, may we be able to set us to set aside those things that would keep us distracted, that would keep us focused on things other than you. Lord, as we pray, as we hear music, as we 
offer ourselves to you. May we experience the joy of your presence. May we experience what it is to feel and to know that you are with us this morning. And Lord, as we leave this place, after our time together, may we be mindful of your presence with us all week long. Lord, may your word to us this morning speak, may it show us how to better follow you. May it show us and speak to us about what we might need to do differently in our lives to follow Jesus more fully. May your word remind us that we are not alone in these difficult times. May your word remind us that you alone are worthy of our worship. And so we ask again, come Holy Spirit into this place this morning that we might know your love and that we might experience your power we pray all of these things in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so in our current climate, singing is a little bit tricky. Um, we have been told by some that singing is a no-no. We have been told by others that singing is okay. And we have been told by even others that singing, as long as your masks are on, is okay. So, all of that to say, we don't have particularly good direction as to exactly how to navigate this situation well. And so, what I would like to do this morning, and understand that this is a fluid situation from week to week as we continue to get direction from various places, including things like the, the uh, conference and CDC and all those other kinds of guidelines. It is fluid, but at least for this morning, what I would like to invite us to do uh, is, uh, as I play some music, as Forrest has over the last couple of weeks, we'll have a video up on the screen. There will be words uh, if you would like to sing along. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable singing, uh, I would invite you to be able to not sing as well. Just use this as an opportunity to, to meditate, uh, the words, um, to pray, however you would like to use this time. Um, and so I'm going to sort of leave it uh, up to your conscience to do what you think is best and right wherever you happen to be sitting this morning. And again, this could be fluid, this could change next week, but for, day, for today, I'll invite you to sing or not sing as you feel comfortable and confident doing. Um, I don't know you guys very well. I don't know your style of music very well. I don't know your particular proclivities, uh, the worst type of music, and those kinds of things. You may find that this music doesn't connect particularly well with you. I'm okay with that. If you don't like it, feel free to shout at me. It's not going to hurt my feelings. I don't offend really at all. Um, but for the most part, I don't offend all that easily. Um, so anyway, with all of that being said, um, again, feel free to uh, sing or not sing as your conscience directs. Um, this first song is called uh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. It's a hymn I'm hoping that you have some familiarity with, even though the style might be slightly different than what you might be accustomed to. So let's go ahead. Uh, I'll invite you to sing or not sing uh, as you see.
the light and the love of Jesus Christ and boldly proclaim the gospel message, the good news, to all of those that we come in contact with. May we be patient, loving, and kind. May we be peacemakers. May we seek out and embrace the marginalized, the people who are left on the edges of society, the people who are in desperate need of attention, love, and kindness. Lord, may we be your people set on mission to build your kingdom. May we be ambassadors taking your message from place to place so that others might come to know the kingdom of light and be taken from the kingdom of darkness. So that you might be honored and glorified. Lord, we pray for those this morning who are sick, for those who are ill, who are struggling with disease, who are injured. We lift them before you this morning and we pray that you would bring healing. We pray for those who are experiencing loss and grief. May your presence be a balm and a comfort to them. We pray for those who are afraid this morning. We pray for their courage and their strength. We pray for those who are struggling to understand what's going on around them. We ask that they might have wisdom, and knowledge, and understanding. Lord, we thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives. We thank you for the work that you are doing in the lives of others. We thank you again for your unfailing love and mercy and grace. Lord, grant us the eyes to see, the ears to hear the places that you are at work. And may we join your work wherever it's taking place. We pray these things in and through the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. All right, so I've got another uh, song. Um, there aren't going to be words that are up on the screen. Um, this is simply an invitation to listen to something really beautiful. I love beautiful things. Beautiful things can inspire us uh, in really cool and amazing ways. And this is just a really beautiful thing uh, that I found. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, um, but this is a, a beautiful a cappella rendition. And I just invite you, if you know the words, you can sing along, but I invite you just to listen and be in awe of the talent and beauty it takes to make this kind of thing happen and rejoice that God does that. That God creates those gifts and talents in each and every one of us to serve him. Uh, and, and I would invite you just to appreciate the beauty of this. It's not long, um, but it is powerful. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, this will be something that you will enjoy but will also lead you into Sweet.
I really do love beautiful things. So, it's always a little scary for everyone uh, when a pastoral change takes place. I'm sure it's scary for all of you because you don't know me. You don't know my family. You don't know my heart. You don't know how I like to do things. I'm sure you're all wondering how long I'll preach on a Sunday morning. I'm sure you're also wondering what kinds of things that I'd like to change. You may even be asking, is he going to like me? Or, will I like him? On my end, I'm asking very similar kinds of questions. How do they like to do things? How long should I preach on Sunday mornings? Will they like me? <clears throat> Will I like them? Are they pro-beard? Are they anti-beard? Are they open to change? What happens when they find out that I love comic books? I love coffee. And I have a somewhat irrational hatred for wearing suits and ties. <laughs> What happens when, not if, but when, I fail them in some way? On top of all that, we have to learn to navigate some new realities together as pastor and congregation. There are a number of things that I don't have answers for. A number of things that I'm not sure what to do with. Is that going to be okay? Will they be willing to work with me as we learn how to navigate, navigate COVID-19? As we determine what that means for our congregation, for our community, and how we interact with each other moving forward. There's often fear surrounding change because with change comes uncertainty. And uncertainty is frequently uncomfortable for us. And there is indeed certainly a tremendous amount of uncertainty before us as we learn to get to know each other, as we try to figure out how best to worship together. But in the midst of that uncertainty, I'm reminded of when a transfer of leadership happened for the Israelites. when Moses was going to have to hand the reins off to Joshua. Moses said to Joshua, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Again, there's certainly a lot that you and I could be nervous about if we chose to make that our focus. But I'd rather focus on something else this morning. I'd rather be strong and courageous in the midst of the anxiety, nervousness, and fear that comes alongside the uncertainty. I'd rather overcome my fears. I'd rather not be discouraged. I'd rather embrace the path that God has put before me and put before us, remembering that God is with us and that he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And with that in mind, I'd like to share a little bit about what God has burdened my heart with as I have been preparing and praying for you all over the last couple of months. I want to dream a little with you this morning. 
I want to dream about the possibilities of what God may do as we strive to run the race of faithfulness together. And so I'd like to look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11 this morning. Here, Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And, in, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians around 61 AD while Paul was in prison in Rome. Paul established the church in Philippi about 10 years prior to his, uh, prior to this, during his second missionary journey. Uh, if you'd like to read a little bit about how that transpired, I'd encourage you to go spend some time reading Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 40. We don't have time to dig into that this morning, but it'd be a good read for you this morning, or for uh, you this week. So Paul's writing to a congregation of believers. He knows them well. And as you read through this letter, it's pretty clear that he has a deep and abiding affection and love for this church. In fact, we see that affection between Paul and the church at Philippi goes both ways. In Philippians 4.18, Epaphroditus is sent by the church with gifts for Paul during his imprisonment. Paul loved that church well. Even after leaving the church, his love for them, as you read through this letter, is evident. As I have gotten to know Pastor Forrest, uh, he and I would meet or met several times leading up to, to me starting and, and his time finishing. As I got a chance to spend time with him, it became immediately clear to me that he felt that same deep love and affection for this congregation that Paul felt for the Philippians. It was clear that Pastor Forrest loved you all. A little time on the church's Facebook page reading through your comments, your likes, your well wishes to him told me everything that I would ever need to know about Pastor Forrest and his tremendous legacy of faithfulness with you all over the last few years. Your kindness, your love for him shine through. And it warms my heart to know that you have been well cared for, well shepherded, and that you have cared well for your pastor and his family. And believe it or not, that's not always easy to find. I've known many pastors who have not been well cared for by their congregations and have left the ministry. And I've known many churches that have not been well cared for and have suffered for it immensely. <coughs> but in the few days that I've already been able uh, to engage with some of you, I've seen a legacy of faithfulness from Pastor Forrest. A legacy of faithfulness from this congregation. And it's inspired me and it has challenged me. And so as we move together, as we move forward together, 
time of transition as we spend time getting to know one another well. It's my desire to know you and to love you as hopefully as well as Pastor Forrest has. And to love you as well as Paul loved the Philippian church. That kind of love doesn't always come easily and it doesn't always come quickly. But as one of my favorite pastors and theologians said, Eugene Peterson, he said, the congregation is the pastor's place for developing vocational holiness. It goes without saying, it is the place of ministry. We preach the word and administer the sacraments. We give pastoral care and administer the community life. We teach and we give spiritual direction. But it is also the place in which we develop virtue, learn to love, advance in hope, become what we preach. As much as I'm here to serve you as a congregation, you all will push me to become what I preach. We live and serve together to push each other deeper into Christ's likeness. And I look forward to serving with you in that capacity. And as we continue to look at this text, we see that Paul is praying some very specific things for the Philippian church. In verses 9 through 11, Paul says he is praying that as a church, their love will overflow. That they will continue to grow in their knowledge and understanding. That they would understand what really matters. That they would live pure and blameless lives, and that they would have righteous character produced in them by Jesus. I want you to know that this is my prayer for you as well. And it's what I commit myself to doing here as I pastor Catanic Free Methodist Church. I will pray to seek to equip you, I will pray and seek to equip you to love God and to love each other well. In Matthew 22, Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was. And his response, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang these two commandments. Everything that we do here is about loving God and about loving others and learning together how to do both of those things better and better every day. It's my prayer that you will individually and corporately seek to love God with everything you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. That our love for God and love for our neighbor will overflow out of us, just as Paul prayed for the Philippian church. I will also commit myself to pray for our knowledge and our understanding of God to grow. We learn to love others well by getting to know them and understand them. It's certainly possible to love somebody from afar or from a great distance, but we can't love them fully in the way they deserve or need to be loved until we know and understand their needs, their wants, their dreams, their hopes, and the things that they themselves love. I would not love my family well if I never got to know them and never understood them. I couldn't love you as a congregation well without getting to know you. And we can't love God well if we're not committed to growing in our understanding and our knowledge of Him. So then I will pray that our knowledge and understanding of God would grow and that I can in some way help facilitate each of us knowing and understanding God more fully. I will commit myself to pray that we all understand what really matters in life and to help teach us to prioritize 
the right things. It isn't easy to know what matters. We can get easily blinded by a variety of different things that can keep us from seeing what is true. There are so many things competing for our attention at any given point in time, and it can be very challenging to navigate our way through that. I will be praying and working to help all of us learn how to better understand what really matters and how to embrace it. I will also work to help us understand how to let go of the other things that are holding us back from Jesus, or from living as Jesus has asked each of us to live. I commit myself to pray and work to see us all live lives that are pure and blameless. Part of what it means to live as a disciple of Christ is to actually live as Jesus did. Jesus lived a pure and blameless life, and we are called to pursue that kind of commitment. I will pray that we all pursue pure and blameless lives, but we must remember that this is work that doesn't happen on its own. And it isn't a matter of us having a strong enough willpower. And it's not a matter of simply making better decisions. As Paul points out for us in verse 11, righteous character is the fruit of our salvation produced in our lives by Jesus. Many folks often assume that they need to clean themselves up before they can find salvation. I've had lots of conversations with folks who said, if I set foot inside the church, the building would collapse. We have this inherent belief in our, our culture and our society that somehow first we must be pure before God will save us. But that's not how things work. God saves us, and then he makes us pure and blameless. And he gives us that righteous character. Paul paints that picture for us here. Righteousness, holiness, Christ-likeness. It's a fruit of our salvation. That means salvation comes first. After that, Jesus produce, produces righteous character in us. And it's imperative, imperative that we get that order correct because a lot of folks just don't understand. Again, they assume they need to clean up first. God will love and accept you as you are and then will produce righteousness in you when you become a follower of Christ. I will pray that we will understand how this works, that it will be true for us, and that we will help others to see this very important truth about God's love for them and how God produces a pure and blameless walk in us. I will also work to remind us of this fact every chance I get. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know how he works in your life. I want you to know that you are not left alone to your own devices to live out the Christian life of obedience and faithfulness in your own strength and power. Paul knew the Philippian church couldn't do it on their own, and so he prayed. He loved them by praying all of these things for them. He may have been in Rome, but he still found a way to serve them and to love them. He knew them, and he knew what they needed. He knew that if he prayed for the church in Philippi in the ways outlined here, God was going to show up, change people's lives, and do some really amazing things. He also knew that as we look at that last part of verse 11, that when these things prayed for would come to pass, God would be glorified. 
I know that if we pray for and to seek to live these things out, to seek to live out an overflowing love for God and for neighbor, if we seek a deeper knowledge and understanding of God, if we seek a clear picture of what matters most in life, if we seek and pray for a walk that is pure and blameless, if we seek a righteous character produced in us through Jesus Christ, and at the end of the day, ultimately, God is going to be glorified and God is going to be praised. You're going to find that I like to close out my sermons with a couple of different things. The first, and you're going to get this every week, just so you know. The first is the take-home point. A take-home point is a thought or an idea that you can latch onto from the sermon to reflect on or to consider during the coming week. The second is the action point. The action point is an invitation. It's an invitation to do a specific, a specific thing in the coming week to live out the take-home point in a practical way. When I was first learning how to do this, to preach, the best advice that I ever got was Make sure that you leave the congregation with something to do. Hence, the take-home point and the action point. So, this morning's take-home point is this. Prayer is the foundation for whatever change we want to see happen. Again, prayer is the foundation for whatever change we want to see happen. We want to see lives changed. We want to see communities change. We want to see something different happen in our church. We want to see people come to know Jesus. Prayer is the foundation for whatever change we want to see happen. Here's your action point for this morning. The thing that you do with the take-home point. I'd invite you to choose one person or one organization could be a friend, family member, spouse, could be a church, could be a place of employment. Choose one person or one organization that you know and use Paul's template for prayer found in verses 9 through 11 to pray for them this week. Pray for them every day using that template, that love would overflow from them, that they would uh, have a deeper knowledge and understanding of God, that they would be able to, um, that they would be able to uh, have a pure uh, and blameless walk, uh, and that righteousness would be the fruit of their salvation. So that's the action point this morning. Find somebody to pray for and use verses 9 through 11 pray for them. As we think about the future together, the things Paul mentions here are the things I will be praying for and the things I am working toward as your pastor. And I'd ask that you would be praying and seeking these things for me as well. And that, I, that you would be praying and seeking these things for each other and for the community that you live in. I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer and the capacity of prayer to change hearts, minds, people, and communities. I believe that prayer is one of the most significant and, and important duties we have as the people of God. And if we truly want to see change in our lives and in the lives of others, it begins with our commitment to be a praying people. Paul understood that, and Paul lived that out. Let each of us be committed to praying for others, as Paul is committed to praying for others.
Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Paul's example to us. We thank you for his heart for the church that he planted. We thank you for his willingness to be a man who was committed to prayer. And Lord, we ask that we would have that same heart then you would create in us a passion and desire to be a praying people. That we would see the utmost importance of coming to you individually and corporately to seek your face, to ask for your intervention, to ask that you would step into difficult situations and that you would do the miraculous that you would change hearts, minds, and lives. Help us to commit to that, to live that out, and to be a people who embrace the loving act of prayer. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, again, as if before, if you'd like to sing along with the song uh, that's going to be up on the video, um, do so as your conscience dictates. Again, I don't know if this is a song that you're necessarily familiar with, um, but I found it appropriate as it connects, I think, into the sermon. Uh, the name of the song is called, Lord, We Need You, or Lord, I Need You. Uh, and so uh, I'd invite you to sing as, as you find it. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides me. Thank you. 
in these difficult and uncertain times where we have a lot of questions, we don't have a lot of answers. Why we need God? There is no other answer. There is no other way forward. There is nothing else to rely on. We need God. Let us pray. Lord, we confess our deep, deep need for you. We thank you that you have been here with us this morning. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you do not leave us to our own devices. Lord, there are many questions on our heart this morning. Many uncertainties, anxieties, and fears. Many things that we would love to know the answers to, but just don't. And so, Lord, we confess again, we need you. Grant us wisdom. Grant us hope. Grant us peace. And as we move through this week, may the gospel be true for us. May the good news of Jesus Christ be true for us. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord toward, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Uh, as we have in the past couple of weeks, we'll dismiss section by section. Um, and uh, just would invite you to uh, be careful as you are leaving, as you go outside, if you want to take some time to interact and to fellowship, uh, make sure that you're taking the appropriate uh, masking and social distancing uh, precautions. So we'll begin our dismissal with uh, this section over here. Now this section. Well,